Hi everyone, my name is Abdul Rahman and today I am accompanied with a uh, very senior psychoanalyst. So she is mainly involved with adults in individual psychotherapy, influenced by the work of Carl Jung. So she's also a certified Jungian analyst and also the member of Jungian Psychoanalytic Association in New York. Uh, her name is Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, for joining me. Hi, and Abdul. How are you? Hi, uh, so how are you doing, Andrea? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much for giving me the time. So today our topic is Jung and synchronicity. So Andrea, how would you uh, enlighten our listeners on synchronicity? Okay. So what I would like to do is I will start by giving a definition of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. So I will... Um, read from a couple of sources. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. synchronicities are meaningful coincidences uh, mm -hmm. that are a causal and they don't have any relationship of time or cause. So Jung himself talked about uh, synchronicity as a meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something mm -hmm than the probability of chance is involved. Um, and I will read from a couple of other places and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. so, um, Daryl Sharp, who wrote a lexicon of Jungian terminology, says that synchronicity is a phenomenon where an event in the outside world coincides meaningfully with a psychological state of mind. Mm -hmm. So here he is bringing this notion of in, interpersonal uh, and what's happening in the world, right? Interpsychic mm -hmm. yep. and what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And so one, um, then he says that Jung associated synchronistic experiences with the relativity of space and time and a degree of unconsciousness. So for that intrapsychic and the outer world, outer world to mm -hmm. create those situations of, of uh, coincidences, there would need to be something unconscious that is trying to make itself seen um, by the person. Mm -hmm. So he says, synchronicity was defined by Jung as a, an a-causal connecting principle, an essentially mysterious connection between the personal psyche and the material world, based on the fact that at bottom, they are only different forms of energy. So uh -huh. that's... That's a very um, important. So is it like uh, we can say that it would be macrocosm affecting or having an impact on the microcosm? Say, well, I guess I, I think I know where, where you're going. You're, you're thinking of macrocosm in terms of Jung's notion of the collective unconscious. Is that where you are? Yeah, exactly. Mm hmm Yes, we could, we could think of it that way. Uh, so, because what Jung, Jung talks about the archetypes as having, they are patterns of energy. So mm -hmm. we can think of them as being alive, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. He says they are formal factors responsible for the organization of unconscious psychic processes. They are patterns of behavior, and they are energy. So um, they are very alive, and they are all the time trying to make themselves expressed, mm -hmm. present in someone's conscious mind. And so in that sense, you can think of the, mi the macrocosmos creating a small or finding channels, right? Which would be then the microcosmos. Is that what you were? Exactly, getting? exactly. I, I believe that's a very good description that uh, all, all those energies in the macrocosm, they find an energy and that's through the uh, inner psychic reality, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so so that's why like the events that are happening at the same time uh so would they be carrying some sort of same energy or or uh, i mean would it be uh, very similar to that like anything happening in outside of the world and in the inner psychic reality would they carry some sort of same energy or how would it happen like or how would how can we link actually something uh, two of the things happening at the same time and uh, having a common uh, goal or task uh i'm not sure i understand your question but if i understand it so when jung talks about the the relationship with time it doesn't actually need to be at the same time mm -hmm. uh, like for instance when he had his own experience and i i will tell the experience you might know it but people who are listening might not know it mm -hmm. but in 1912 he was um, very upset he had just had his uh, break with Freud mm -hmm. um, so his life and his work was very very um, challenged and he was on the train coming back I guess from Austria to back to Switzerland mm -hmm. and he during that train ride, he had a vision. Uh, he, he said that it lasted for many minutes. And it, it would be what some people in the psychiatric world would, might call it a psychotic break or a psychotic mm -hmm. moment of a hallucination, right? Mm -hmm. Where he saw the whole land being uh, flooded by blood and he knew that there was something there that was very very important um mm -hmm. and later he thought that that vision that he had was announcing the coming of the first great war which didn't happen until six years later right or five years later mm -hmm. so it doesn't need to be at the same time but it's like it's it he talks about synchronicity as also being present in um, situations where there is a precognition, like mm -hmm. for instance, that if you go to talk to a psychic and the psychic says, oh, I see that you have, you're going to receive a good work proposal. That can be, and you, then you leave there and you get a good, uh, work proposal that can be also called the synchronicity it doesn't have to be but it can also be so one thing that's very important to keep in mind is that what what is it that makes these um coincidences meaningful exactly right? mm -hmm. um and so that's when jung says the coincidence is only meaningful when it links back to this to these deeper levels of, of the psyche of the unconscious and mm -hmm. so you can have a coincidence and not make any you know that coincidence might not make any difference in your life you might get to a room and say oh look at that everybody here is wearing some shade of blue and that might not do anything to you and then exactly. I might get there and say, oh, my God, everybody here is wearing blue. And, and that might mm -hmm. have. A yep. And so that for me is a synchronicity of some in some way, but not for you because you didn't register it in that. Way. Exactly. I, and it makes sense. So yep. The fact that that caught my attention, even if I don't have any understanding of what it means, the fact mm -hmm. that it caught my attention in that way indicates that there is possibly some, it's almost like a magnet that resonates in, mm -hmm. you know, in my psyche to that. So there is something that is ready to be channeled, if you will, right? So it, um, it seems like a very unconscious recognition because uh, as if someone isn't able to register at deeper levels, so that means that might, he might be not conscious of the deeper patterns going on yes 
Absolutely. And Jung would say, um, I don't know exactly in what, uh, in what volume he says that, but at some point he says something like, not with these words, but he says, you know, sometimes life is actually more exciting when you are living an unconscious life because this, uh -huh. this energy is there making all these very exciting things happen exactly. on the outside to catch your attention. Yeah. Uh, and then you start doing your analysis and the more you establish a mm -hmm. bridge of conversation, of access between conscious and unconscious, the less there is a need for, the, for those things to happen, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> the excitement is over. But exactly. I had, with myself, I had a very interesting example that for me marks very well the notion of, uh, of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Because it was in uh, on October 10th, so it was 10th uh -huh. of 1999, mm -hmm. um, I went to run some errands. I was already living here in New York because I am originally from Brazil, and mm -hmm. I moved here in 1994. So mm -hmm. I was already living here, and I was running some errands, and I bought flowers and they cost ten dollars and then i got to the health food store mm -hmm. and got something when i was going to pay uh the bill the check was 10 10 mm -hmm. and so i just very casually it did not hit me that you know today's october 10 it none of that i just said wow I just paid ten dollars, and now it's ten ten. And the um, the cashier at the health food store said, "Well, you should actually get a lottery ticket because you exactly know, play the number ten. And I said, "Well, I need the number ten and uh -huh. all the other ones." Uh, but it was that exchange and that moment that I thought, "Ha, huh, that's weird." And there was something about that that made mm -hmm. me then. Real, that I then realized, wait a minute, today's October 10. And, you know, and then in numerology, if you add things up, you know, the number, the year 1999 would also add up to a 10. And, and that started, you know, and I then started noticing that there were so many things in my life that added up to 10. Mm -hmm. Like the, the building I lived in was 820. Uh, my apartment was 5E, which added up to a 10. Um, my office was at 347 Fifth Avenue, and all of these things were things that would add up to 10. Um, uh -huh. the, day, the day I got married, the, the marriage date was also adding up to a 10. Everything, and my daughter who was... So uh, interlinked. So all of these, and in that moment was when I thought, oh my God, the number 10 is meaningful in my life. Now, mm -hmm. I had made all these other things before, totally unconscious. They were all falling on the number 10. So there mm -hmm. were these coincidences, but I was not even aware of them. Mm -hmm. Now, from the moment that that became part of my awareness... Then, of course, I went to see what is the meaning of this, of the number 10, and I read, and I this and I that, but I wasn't able to come to necessarily any conclusion in terms of what wanted to be seen, but the number 10 became a very significant signal for me. Mm -hmm. So whenever I see myself, I find myself in a situation, and I am wondering, do I do it, do I not? If the number 10 shows up, I feel reassured that that's exactly where I need to be. So mm -hmm. it's, for instance, last year I was looking to uh, move my office. I needed an office a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. and I had been at that same office for 19 years already, and I was like, it's time to move on. And, and so I was looking to stay in the same area. Mm -hmm. And a friend of, which was in Midtown and then in Manhattan. And then mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine who works in the financial district said, there is an office here 
in the building that I think is exactly the size that you want. And I said, oh no, it's too far from the current office. My patients are not going to, they're going to complain that they're going to have to go all the way downtown and mm -hmm. all of that. And he said, well, think about it. I will send you the video that the, the landlord sent me. Mm -hmm. and, and so he sends me the, the attachment with the video and the video says office on the 10th floor. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. So, so I, I was like, okay, I have to at least go there and look at this mm -hmm. office. It's not. So were, were you excited more on that time or were you scared? <laughs> Cause it, it seems more scary. <laughs> No, it didn't scare me. It was, it was, to me, it was like I need to at least consider this place because by now I know that the number 10 is meaningful to me. And so yeah. let me go take a look at the place. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so I went and I, it, it felt perfect. It's great. And I'm there. I've been there now for a year. My patients never complained about having to go downtown. <laughs> and, and it's great. And I love the space. So there are little things like that but it's uh mm -hmm. what makes it significant is the fact mm -hmm. that it grabs us in some way it's like uh can i tell what happened the other day with with us mm -hmm. <laughs> movie? exactly i mean um, uh, i was watching the movie uh the, it was a documentary i believe right and it yeah. was just mercy and yeah. i was watching around 8 30 or 9 30 p.m and we had a meeting next day on Zoom, and I and I just randomly told you that I was watching a documentary or a movie, Just Mercy, and you said that exactly I was watching the same documentary or movie at the same time. Yes, I, and I mean, and we were discussing on the topic of synchronicity, and mm -hmm. and that and that thing happened. So obviously, they they carry some uh, deeper meaning. Maybe at some time earlier or later. We, we come to know about that, but I'll tell you something very interesting which just happened right now. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I really want to ask you that either it's synchronicity or not. You know what, since a few days, I was thinking on like how people forcefully impose their opinions on us, right? Mm -hmm. So I was really thinking on that. Like uh, they should respect the individual opinions. Or if there is a disagreement, that should be in a very healthy way, right? So. Yeah. I read someone's post. Uh, he's not an analyst, but he's someone into too much of Indian psychology. So he posted something like that. Uh, Holmes feeling or assessment of character, strength and weakness or relative worth or worthlessness seriously should matter to us. So he said that my provisional answer only when we are in an active, committed and reciprocal relationship with them or where mutual understanding and good communication are essential to fruitful cooperation. So he answered that whose assessment of her character comments should matter really to us. Mm -hmm. And someone just commented down to that. It's synchronicity or a gift from the God. Cause I shared that thing with him and I didn't realize that I posted that actually I shared his post. But someone commented on the bottom that it's maybe a synchronicity. Uh, the answer you were looking for is just there. <laughs> I it's, mean, it's it's great. I and it just happened right now. Yes, I should snap. It's it's amazing. I as I told you that for me, even before I knew what synchronicities were about, I was always very intrigued by. Um, coincidences. I have memories of situations of when I was like a little child of being like, for instance, I remember I was probably five or six years old mm -hmm. and my mother, someone in the family died and my mother went to the funeral and left me with my grandmother and my grandmother um, was going to visit a friend of hers that I didn't know who that I had never met. And so I was kind of mm -hmm. nervous going and, and I got there and there were only adults in the family and all these old people and I was there alone. And then there was a little dog. Mm -hmm. And when the, 
the dog saw me, he came to play with me, and the owner of the dog said, oh, her name is Lady. And Lady was the name of my dog. And I remember oh. that that for me was like, oh, okay, I can trust this place. I felt totally, because it was like, this is, this is no longer something that I don't know. This is, there's exactly. Something but like more home towards you. Yes. So even, even at that age, there was a meaning for me, the fact that there was that little coincidence there. Mm -hmm. And it was when I was, before I went to psychology school, mm -hmm. I went to art school. And when I was in art school, I, because of coincidences, I decided that uh, I saw one day at a book store the the uh, the little essay of Jung's on synchronicity and I said oh I should read this because so many um coincidences happen in my life and so I I read and I fell in love with with Jung and I could not now when I read it I I know that I did not understand anything back then <laughs> I had no mm -hmm. idea but, but it made so much sense to me that I stopped, I quit, you know, at the end of that year, I quit uh, art school and went into psychology. So, so obviously, maybe those events, they carried some deeper message. And, and here you are today. So obviously, everything was so interlinked. So do you think that it's like a cosmic force? Because, uh, again, like, why do these events are not if simultaneously occurring at the same time, but maybe two events uh, yeah. occurring for the same thing or same goal or same deeper meaning. So is this kind of a cosmic energy? Well, that could be, how, how do you understand that? How do you, when you say, what, what is it that you, you call a cosmic energy? Uh, I mean, everything see in the universe, uh, could be so interlinked, so connected, as we talk about archetypal astrology, right? So everything uh, of the celestial nature, of the celestial bodies, they, they are so much interlinked with the human psyche, right? Mm -hmm. If those archetypes of planets are, those are, they have some kind of energy which have an impact on human psyche, then why not like the whole of the universe or the cosmic force or the energy uh, that makes synchronicity or two events happen for a deeper meaning. So it's more like a grand scheme. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because this way, see, it, it makes maybe more sense if we think in a, in a maybe a spiritual way that it's kind of a grand scheme uh, moving us towards something more meaningful for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sometimes we recognize that sometimes we don't sometimes as I just told you about the example of Facebook someone else just pointed out and it, it clicked my unconscious mm -hmm. and, and then I wasn't conscious of that because I posted it myself but yeah. I didn't realize it at that time mm -hmm. but when someone else just uh, highlighted that it's maybe something which you were thinking the other day so then mm -hmm. I realized oh that's that's something synchronicity and it makes sense. It happened for a reason. Maybe to yes. make me aware of how I should react to things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. thing. that's the biggest challenge is that the synchronicities, they have the impact of making you stop and rethink, right? Mm -hmm. you, you pay mm -hmm. attention to that in that moment and you say, what about this moment needs to be, do I need to pay attention to? Or what is it that I need to, you know, to rethink? And, and then, you know, you go on your own quest to try to mm -hmm. understand it. Um, and, and that's the hardest part because you don't always, you know, especially when you are dealing with these energies mm -hmm. that are so far from our consciousness, right? It's mm -hmm. very hard to, to make sense of them. Um, exactly. I, I can think of situations that you were saying that, and there was something that came to mind. It was, again, something that happened with me many years ago when, when I was still in training at the Institute. Mm -hmm. There was a moment there that was, you know, very hard. Everybody has a moment in training that is very Exactly. Difficult. 
And so, you know, I was really feeling stuck and feeling depressed. And, and I was talking to my analyst about it and saying, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. Maybe I should just, you know, take a break. And, and I don't remember exactly what the situation was, but he, he asked me something to the extent of, if, if it doesn't change, what do you think this is going to be like? And I said, oh, my God, I get, I get um, almost claustrophobic feeling that I'm totally mm -hmm. stuck and that I am imprisoned and that I will never get out of, of this state. And when I said that, there was a plant next to him and a little white butterfly just flew out of that plant. The, I don't know if the butterfly had been there all the time, just listening to our conversation. Mm -hmm. But in that moment when I said, there will, I will never, I will feel that I'm stuck and will never be able to come out of here, this butterfly flew out. And it was so, so important for me because that was what reassured me that, you know, this, this butterfly one day was stuck trying to move also you know and mm -hmm. the butterfly is the biggest symbol of transformation the biggest right symbol of, of metamorphosis of, mm -hmm. of just going from one state to another and it gave me the trust that I needed to continue that I was exactly where I needed to be and that mm -hmm. at some point that would be released I would be released from it and so it didn't happen right away, but it, but I, mm. that incident, that little coincidence made me trust the process of analysis, trust the process of training. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I believe such moments maybe also kind of encourage you towards transformation or maybe look deeper into yourself or mm -hmm. all uh, the phenomena or in, into macrocosm or everything happening in the outer world maybe yeah absolutely yeah well the, you know the, the other thing is that Jung talked and I think that that links to the to the cosmic uh, power which is um, how he understood oracles in general and he mm -hmm. he wrote the preface to the Ishing. do you know the Ishing? Um, uh, I'm not aware of that. It's a, it's a book of change. It's a it's a Chinese text, mm -hmm. and it has it's thousands of years old. And mm -hmm. what it is is that um, it observes. It's it's a Taoist uh, text, and so mm -hmm. it observes the 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 movements in nature, and based on the elements of nature. They created mm -hmm. uh, it's sixty four exagrams, and exagrams mm -hmm. one of them has six lines, right? And so, mm -hmm. yep, one of them will represent one movement in nature. So the titles will be something like I know that the number one is the creative, and then it's the receptive, but then it's like you get stuff like uh, mountain over the lake or. Mm -hmm. Uh, rain over the mountain or mm -hmm. floor under the lake and you know things like that and they the text is very cryptic it's very metaphoric um, but the way you you find out what your what what exagram you should be reading mm -hmm. is that you formulate a question about a mm -hmm. situation Right, like you, you ask the oracle to give you a counsel on, like for instance, your podcast. Um, mm -hmm. You're thinking about starting this podcast, and you say, "What, what does the Ishing have to tell me about my podcast?" And then you can either throw three coins or use um, sticks, wooden sticks, and depending on the configuration that these three coins falls, you will know if you have a full line or a line with an interruption in the middle. And so mm -hmm. you throw the three coins six times, one time for each line. Mm -hmm. And then you see what, what configuration it formed, then you go and you read about that exagram.
And so Jung's, Jung wrote the preface to that book uh, when it was, you know, in the, I think it was in, in the 40s or 50s that Richard Wilhelm, um, you know, recovered the text. He was studying Chinese philosophy and, and he said, this is, this is really cool and interesting. And he sends it to Jung and Jung becomes fascinated by it. And, um, and so he wrote um, the preface and he talks about his understanding of what happens with these oracles. Mm -hmm. And by that, he's talking about the Ching, he's talking about the tarot, he's talking about the runes, all of these things that we use, right, when we want to ask a question that we don't quite know the answer. So he says, we're asking a question, it's the answer that we need to receive already lives in us. But uh -huh. when, when we focus, it's almost like we are opening a little door for the archetype, for that uh -huh. answer, you know, to manifest itself on the outside. And so we will throw, we don't have the conscious awareness of, you know, this is what I should do, or this is the way that makes more sense now. Mm -hmm. The help of the coins and the text, but the coins and the text are going to be there just mirroring something that already exists in our psychic world. Does that exactly. make sense? Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. So it would be just like, uh, some so just like coins if if a person if a third person or an observer uh as you just said mentioned about an uh, example that if someone uh comes to the apartment or a house and see everyone wearing a blue shirt right so mm -hmm. he won't be surprised in that way and if someone else is coming in the same room and sees ev see everyone wearing that blue shirt so he she or he, he or she would be very much surprised. So maybe it, it's like uh, something doesn't hit my unconscious, but it's important for someone else. But there are some people or some uh, texts or something like that, which are mirrored for the actual things or realities, psychic realities happening within us, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, it, mm -hmm. so they it, kind of, uh, also magnify says everything. Yes, and, and he says, you know, these chance uh, situations, right? But when they start happening one after the other, they, then you start paying attention. They're no longer just like, you know, chance. They're not just a coincidence. Mm -hmm. It is, it is um, an intersection, if you will, of the two mm -hmm. realities, of the inner and the outer realities. Mm -hmm. Right, so these are the moments when when they happen, mm -hmm. and it, you know uh, another example, for instance, that um, that comes to mind. I mean, there are so many things. I do uh, uh, a lot of work with a technique of collages, um, mm -hmm. and when I'm doing that work, it's so many times that the synchronicities start popping up. You know, that someone will tell me. Uh, a dream and then uh, we go to work on the collages and they choose the images with their eyes closed. They pick up from mm -hmm. a pile of images with their eyes closed and a number of times an image from a dream shows up in the collage too and you know it's it's very common. It's not but I once had a dream because that's that's the other thing where Jung says, you know, are there premonitory dreams or not? And what do you, how do we, what do we make of them, right? Because you only know if it's premonitory after the fact. You know, you, if I dream that my neighbor had a car accident, I will not know if that was premonitory until after the neighbor has or not the car accident. Mm -hmm. But, um, but he says there are certain, certain situations, and he tells on memory, dreams, and reflection, he tells an account of a dream that he had, and he also tells an account of a dream that a patient had. 
and where he says, okay, even if we don't know what this coincidence means, so like for instance, um, the, the dream that the patient had, the patient was someone who was very rational, very concrete, and who didn't really believe in symbols that much and didn't, or didn't quite get, you know, the, the layers, the symbolic layers mm -hmm. of psyche. And she is telling him that in the dream, she had received a, a jewelry, a brooch that was mm -hmm. in the form of a beetle. And when she said that, Jung heard a noise on the window behind him, and he looked, and through the window came in a beetle and entered the room. It was mm -hmm. as she was saying it, it happened. And he says that it's a kind of beetle that is not even common in that area. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was all that that patient needed to, to then say, oh, wait a minute, there is something here that is, you know, worth taking a look. Mm -hmm. um, and so he says, even when we don't know the meaning, we know that that dream, we need to spend more time with it. We need to really pay attention at it because it, whatever it's trying to tell us is very important. Yep, so, that, that, that's interesting. That makes sense. Yeah. So I had, when I was, again, early on in my, you know, career, like first or second year seeing patients, I one day had this dream that I was walking to my office, and when I got to the area, everything was, you know, had been bombarded, and there had been an attack, and I was worried trying to contact my first patient. This is before there were cell phones, right? And so mm -hmm. I tried to contact my patient, my first patient, to tell him that I was going to be late or that I was not going to be able to get to the office. But then I see that there is a place in a wall with a list of names of people who had mm -hmm. bodies that had been already um, recovered and they had the names and so i thought oh let me see if i see my patient's name in there mm -hmm. maybe he was on his way to the office and i woke up i was looking through the names and i didn't know i woke up before i had an answer whether or not his name was there and so that was a very upsetting dream and it was kind mm -hmm. of a nightmare anyway so that day I go to my office and he was indeed my first patient that day and I got oh. there and there was a message in the answering machine and mm -hmm. he was saying oh I'm not feeling well I'm not gonna go to our session today I already thought hmm that that's weird I had this dream and I wonder if he's okay if everything is fine uh, and then later that day, his partner called me to let me know that he had actually tried to commit suicide and was now hospitalized. And oh. so that to me was, was horrible because it was a very, very bad kind of synchronicity, if you will, right? Yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. But it did teach me that, you know, the next time, Hopefully that will not happen again. It hasn't in 25 years, and hopefully it will, <laughs> will not. But, I, uh, but I, I remember talking about that with my supervisor at the time and saying, well, there is one thing that I get from this if, is that if I could go back, what I would thank God the guy did not die. He was fine afterwards. But once I got to my office and heard that message, I might – today pick up the phone and say you get yourself here now you know mm -hmm. i need to have mm -hmm. a session with you it doesn't matter even if it needs to be a phone session but you know having had that dream when i got the message saying i'm not feeling okay if i could go back i would call and say no you come here and let's talk but we learn right <laughs> so mm -hmm. exactly I mean, that, that, that should have been very, uh, obviously, scary for you because when, obviously, the patients uh, reach so extreme. So, do, 
I mean, I have a question from here. Like when you're with the patients or clients or, or even someone you're generally helping, so you have an interaction with someone. So is there a kind of any uh, psychic relation that develops with time when, when you start to have shared dreams? So would, would it be same linking to synchronicity or be more uh, having a shared psychic reality? Uh, so your, your question is a two-part question. Uh, and the two answers are yes and yes. <laughs> so definitely uh, one of the things that I think is the biggest contribution that Jung gives to, to the field of psychology is his notion of the field that gets mm -hmm. oscillated when you are in the presence of somebody else. And so psychoanalysis, classical psychoanalysis and Freud would defend very much the notion that the analyst is in a neutral position and that you are not, um, exactly. right? Your world is not to be rocked by exactly. the world. And, and no that, transference and counter-transference. Exactly. You understand the counter-transference and you analyze, mm -hmm. but it's not... Uh, you know, there isn't an interaction. When Jung said no, uh, he, I, I, the words are not exactly those, but he mm -hmm. says along the lines of the meeting of two people is like the meeting of two chemical substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed. Both transformed, exactly. So I, I too have a... Uh, I mean, difference of opinion with uh, here from Freud that obviously you can't be too much alienated from a patient or s anyone helping that you just stay neutral and don't have any. You can be aware of transference and counter transference, but still you need to have some kind of relation, obviously, mm -hmm. so that it, it needs to be felt. Otherwise, I don't think so that. Uh, the treatment or you would be able to actually uh, feel the suffering or what, whatever is going inside the patient. Yes, that is one aspect. And the other, and I think that that, so this is the beauty of Jung, but it's also very tricky because it can be misunderstood as, oh, so then I will share the space with my patient. And uh, and that, that's kind of tricky because for me, at least when I am working, uh, and this is, is an area of interest, my last year there was a, an international Jungian uh, conference in uh, Vienna. And, mm -hmm. and the paper that I presented there was actually about that, about the transference and the work with the transference, which is mm -hmm. how do we acknowledge that we are being touched and transformed by this person who's sitting there and opening their hearts to us, right? Mm -hmm. Without stealing the analytic space that is theirs. You know, the person who's coming is coming because that space is reserved for them to look mm -hmm. at themselves, to get to know themselves. They're paying me to do that work. And so if I then start, you know, saying, oh, you know, while you're working at this, it's making me think about that in me, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I am uh, imposing my life in the space that belongs to the patient. It, it's it, also maybe, it, it also maybe refers to sometimes, uh, Freud would say it, conversational uh, narcissism, maybe, mm -hmm. Fr Freud, Freud would maybe say that. Yes, absolutely. And I agree with that. It's like it becomes then, you know, another problem. So it's to me, it was like, okay, so how do I make my reality experienced by the patient without taking away from, from their uh, experience? And why is that important for me? It's because I think that when we, in, at least in my experience in life, any time that I felt that I was being accompanied, mm -hmm. the experience was much safer and I was able to go much deeper because I felt mm -hmm. that I was not alone. And when we go into these, you know, this search for who we are, it is already something that by nature is a process that is very lonely because mm -hmm. we are 
wrong with our own ghosts, right? And uh, but if I can feel that you know cer there are certain things that become available to me because I am in the presence of this person, uh, then it's a different. It's totally different than trying to, for instance, do a self help book. People ask me, "What do you think of self help books?" I say the ideas tend to be very good, but there's a mm -hmm. reason why thousand self-help books out there and not just one it's because you know when you're trying to do it on your own it's it's very hard when you when you hit the first obstacle you stop you go mm -hmm. into you know for the time that it is flowing when you really come come up against your first big uh complex or your first first big ghost then you stop. But if you are in the presence of someone who's walking with you and who's growing with you, then it's a different situation. You exactly. feel exactly, and, and that very much happens uh, in our individual lives. I believe mm -hmm. that uh, people share a lot of stuff uh, with each other, and it's a very common practice. I believe that people would listen less to them and mm -hmm. talk more about their wounds and because they, they might have uh, similar stories but obviously uh, the individual suffering or pain would, would, would be different there would be diversity it, it, you might suffer from something uh, same like them but but the intensity can be different right so yeah. you, you can't you can't really uh, uh, sh share your reality or maybe it's as you said it's a very tricky situation the mm -hmm. analyst or the helper needs to know when to share and when it's safe to share. Uh -huh. So I and believe... You know, the, the second part of your question in terms of having similar dreams or even just like, uh, even if the, the dreams are not similar, but like any time that I dream about a patient, I really feel like, okay, why is this person showing up in my dream? And I really need to take this seriously because I am working on a state of extreme vulnerability, right? The people exactly. who come, they are in a state, they're really giving themselves. And so I need to, to see what is it about the dream. And, uh, and now when the dreams, I can only think of one situation and it was not with a patient. It was with a friend of mine where we had very similar dreams the same night. And I think, it's more along the lines of what you are saying it's that and it can happen with a patient too which is it's that it's almost like there is a uh, um if you think of of psyche as a sponge if you you know if you think mm -hmm. about it that way that there are um places that you know where there are little holes in the filter and that you know our psyches match somewhere in outer exactly. space Mm -hmm. you know reverberated and so the field yep. is a very very important concept also in in the notion of synchronicities with Jung. Mm -hmm. it's, it's energy that, that's interesting it's energy that you know things happen mm -hmm. so uh should we move on to the next one or do you think something should be more said here i believe Unis Mundus, an expression of deeper order. So what I had started saying was that in some ways we have talked about it already, but we have just mm -hmm. not, I mean, not gone deeper and not um, called it the Unus mm -hmm. Mundus. But it's, um, Unus Mundus means one world, right? So it's, mm -hmm. I would say that I think of it in the same way that the Buddhists talk about interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, it's when Jung talks about the, the collective unconscious, he's talking about an underlying reality that is unified, that belongs to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. But he's also saying, from that place we come, and that's the place we're going to go back to, right? Mm -hmm. and so um, at some point, and I was actually, while I was waiting for you, I was um, looking 
to see if I could find the quote, and I, I, I couldn't. But there in, in some place, Jung talks about the work in, in, in the process of individuation. You are always trying to create a balance um, between one side and the other, right? So when you think about the archetypal world and you think about the fact that all aspects of the information are there, and so if you think of uh, the expression of the archetype of the mother, for instance, you're going to have both the information of the of the great mother and the information of the devouring mother. Exactly. And the work for us is to create a tension between the, the opposites. We recognize that they're both present. We recognize that living in one extreme or another is not ideal. And so we, we live in the tension with one foot in each world. And so he talks about that tension of opposites being present in everything. It's also exactly. the tension between how much uh, energy do I spend trying to stay connected to the material reality and how much of it do I give to connecting to the transcendent reality, to the spiritual world, to this more unconscious um, manifestations, right? And so in the um, work, I think it's in the text where he talks about the symbolism of the mandalas, that mm -hmm. he talks about um, in this process, there are moments uh, where there is a lot of disorganization, of psychological disorganization, and that the... Um, that psyche itself, in an attempt to create order and to bring balance, it will offer images of the mandalas, right? It's, so it's like the person might think, might have a dream of, um, oh, we were sitting around a table. And so mm -hmm. this is already implying an attempt to organize, to order um, that chaos, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that is, it's a natural tendency of the psyche is to bring order, to bring balance. Uh, it might be a better word than mm -hmm. order. It, and so mm -hmm. he talks about uh, the, the mandala as being a psychological equivalent of the unus mundus in that it brings you know things back to the beginning or the notion of the spiral that comes back and reorganizes and and so in that essay he talks also about how if the mandala is this um the psychological equivalent of the unus mundus the synchronicity mm -hmm. is the parapsychological equivalent of Lunus Mundus. In other words, when something material happens, when something happens outside of us, it, it's also hap ha uh, happening in an attempt to create that balance and to bring us back to that place of origin. It, it reminds me of one of the Jung's uh, quote as well, in all chaos there is a cosmos and an all disorder, a sacred disorder. Mm -hmm, I, I, mm -hmm. I believe it, it's, it would somehow resonate here because yeah. uh, like uh, again it's as I talked initially about the cosmic energy so mm -hmm. it's, it's all about the grand scheme and uh, all the chaos happening maybe outside in the material world uh, mm -hmm. could be a kind of a, and, and all the disorder in, in the outer world could, could mean some uh, it could mean some kind of a secret order in your inner psychic reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so they, they, they are very much related. So as, as you yeah. mentioned all, so as you said that they, they are there to uh, make us go to the initial state where we mm -hmm. can integrate both sides. As you said, uh, you gave the example of mother archetype. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Holding the tension of both. So uh, that it, it's kind of wholeness. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and that is, is something that once you become, you start reading more Jung and becoming more familiarized with his way of, of seeing things, it becomes a natural uh, 
way of listening or of understanding the world. It's like, even in moments like right now, which is a moment of so much chaos and so much um, sadness and so many losses and so much fear that's up in the air, is that you know that, you know, this is part of the work to create balance, uh, you know, that hopefully hopefully we, that's where we are headed. We're headed to a place of more balance and more integration of value mm -hmm. and of even respect towards each other, towards nature, towards the cosmos, right? As you mm -hmm. pointed. So. Exactly. So, so like, as you said about the initial, it's, it's all about uh, restoring uh, the, the expression of deeper order as Yunus Mundus, it would be uh, restoring to the original state or initial state. So can we say that about the divine unconsciousness or maybe consciousness? Would that be that state of divine unconsciousness of the world? Divine unconsciousness of the world? What do you... Mm. So, so like restoration of the original state of cosmos? Mm-hmm. So, as we said, uh, Anus Mundus, would, can we relate that to the uh, original state of cosmos and divine unconsciousness of the world? Oh, I see what you mean. I guess, I guess you could. I mean, if you think about it in terms of a place of origin, right? Is that where you're mm -hmm. coming yep, from? Yes. Yep. Yes, absolutely. So then, uh, then it would be the going, that movement of starting from there and coming back to it. Uh, it's like almost like dissolving in that place again, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So all the disorder we had, and then through chaos, we reached the order again, kind of stability, mm -hmm. kind of stability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah that, 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 that makes, makes clear sense. sense. I mean, uh, it, it really God willing. <laughs> Sorry? God willing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I believe we, we are quite done with the uh, explanation of synchronicity. And we, mm -hmm. we had uh, actually, it was a real learning experience for me with too many examples, mm -hmm. much of your learning experience as an analyst during your training years. And also, my, I, I just gave one example of Facebook that just happened during all that. And uh -huh. it even gave me some deeper meanings and uh, it, it now allows me to believe more in that. Because when mm -hmm. you actually experience something, yes, you got to believe that and you got to take it some very seriously. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, I thank you so much for the invitation. This was fun. It was fun to talk to you. I really thank do you. wish you all the success in, thank in you. this. I think it's it's a very good thing that you are doing. Um, Thank you, you so can. much, Andrea, for coming and joining me on the podcast. It was great experience learning from you. My pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good Thank one. You. Bye. Bye-bye.